You're my rock. You're my fortress. You're my king. You're my provider. (laughs) You've led us into the land flowing with milk and honey. (laughs) So that we can be like Caleb and say, give me my mountain. (laughs) Something that you're standing for, believing for in your life, that you can say, give me my mountain. Maybe you ran around in the desert for 40 years with a bunch of unbelievers, because that's what Caleb did. That's what Joshua did. They, they, they were with the people that didn't qualify for the promised land. Maybe that's what you did all your life, but not tonight. You're with a whole bunch of Joshuas and a whole bunch of Caleb's. Give me my mountain. Give me my mountain. And then Caleb's daughter, she, she got a hold of daddy's faith. And Caleb's daughter, I forget her name, go read it. And she got a hold of Caleb's faith. Women weren't even supposed to have an inheritance. And she says, I want the upper springs and the lower springs on that mountain. <laughs> I mean, you talk about out of place and out of position. And Caleb goes... He must have learned a thing or two from his daddy, his father God, and he gives her everything her heart desired. (laughs) You want to take a hold of your mountain. Tonight's your night. You take a hold of your mountain. You say, that's my mountain. I am going to conquer it. If it needs to be cast in the sea, you can do that with it because it's your mountain. (laughs) Amen. Hallelujah. God is so good. Been so good to me. He's so good to you. He's good whether we recognize it or not. He's good whether we praise Him or not. He's good whether we worship Him or not. He's always good. It's up to us to understand and realize it and say, God is a good God. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, one way we relish His goodness, reflect His goodness, is by loving one another, right? Isn't that how we do it here? So if we love each other, shake somebody's hand, tell them, thank you for coming to Church of the Word. We love you. Love on somebody. Make sure they're okay. Make sure that their refrigerator's full their gas tanks full, overflow, amen? That's what we do here. We love each other. We make sure everybody's taken care of, amen? Greet them, shake somebody's hand, say we love you here, Church of the Word. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Church of the Word. Good to see everybody tonight. Hallelujah. So first of all, we just want to say thank you to everyone who pitched in and helped with the food stand. And yeah, we thank God. <laughs> yes. yes, thank God. It was a success and everybody's help was appreciated. So thank you again. So for the announcements, we have prayer Monday from noon to one. And then from now on, it will be every Wednesday and Friday from 6 to 7 a.m. So... And that is every week, correct, Pastor Jay? Or for February for sure. So we have Bible study Tuesday evening at 7.30. All are welcome. And kids ages 3 to 12 will be dismissed during the offering song for kids ministry. Also, Impact Ladies 65 Plus will meet every Monday at 2 p.m. here at church. And again, if you have any questions on that, see Peggy for details. So the men's prayer breakfast will be the third Sunday of every month. Prayer will be from 7 to 8 a.m., then they'll go out for breakfast. And Kurt Owens will be sharing with us the third week of February, third weekend, I should say. So I think there will be more details to come, which days and everything. And Impact Youth Group will be next Sunday evening, February 5th, here at church. 
from 6.30 to 8.30. Hallelujah. Super Bowl party. <laughs> See how we're going to, yes, we'll be hosting a Super Bowl party here at church on February 12th. Go. I'll just, I'll leave that out of that. <laughs> I think if anybody knows me, know who I'll be, I'm cheering for, but what's that got to do with anything? But anyway, gives a little bit of emotion, excitement for maybe a week, then it's like, yay. But anyway, <clears throat> I don't know if y'all, any, I'm just kind of a side thing here. I don't know how, like when we sing worship songs and there's a new song and like if it, if it, I kind of like the like it that it's scriptural, so I sometimes have a hard time worshiping with it if it's you know if I'm wondering about it. But the Honey and the Rock song, I was like, well, that phrase, you know, like where is that out of? So I, I found it. If anybody else is wondering, <laughs> Deuteronomy thirty-two thirteen, it says, uh, "He made him ride on the high place of the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields." And he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. So what I get out of it right off the bat, honey is a sign of uh, provision. You know, the uh, promised land, you, just, you were talking about it, flowed with milk and honey. Provision. So, But a rock, what's the rock represent? Jesus. Hallelujah. And then in Psalms 81.16 also, it says, He should have fed them also with the finest of the wheat and with honey out of the rock. Should I have, should I have satisfied thee or you? So, hallelujah. So, so that song is scriptural. <laughs> uh, I don't know why my brain acts like that, but if we're singing something. It's like, well, I need to go look that up, see what... <laughs> that has any scriptural, but anyway, hallelujah, where, where am I at, um, let's go to 1 John 4, or 3 actually, 1 John 3, <clears throat> what I'm going to look at is uh, our hearts, if our heart doesn't condemn us, then we can ask whatever we will, hallelujah, so then I'm going to go back over to Mark 11, but here in uh, 1 John 3, 19 is where I'm going to start. It says, And hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. I just like that. You know, if our heart's condemning us, God isn't condemning us, but sometimes our heart does condemn us. But even in that, we can know that God's still greater than us, than our heart. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence towards God. So if our heart's not condemning us, we have confidence. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. At one point, that, I don't know, I guess from religion, I would have looked at that and like, oh, I'll keep his commandments. Ten commandments. Or the 600, however many they are. But that's not, he actually goes on sometimes if you just keep reading, it explains itself. In verse 23, says, And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. So his commandment is that you should believe. And if you jump back up to 22, it says, And do those things that are pleasing in his sight. This goes with Hebrews 11, where it talks about. But there's only one way to please God, by faith. It's talking about faith. So, same thing, believing. Believing on Jesus. And of course, it goes on, He that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him, and hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Hallelujah. So, our heart's not condemning us. We can ask whatsoever we will. So, let's go over to Mark 11. Mark 11. Who, who did they say this? They wrote this? Kenneth Hagin? Or? <laughs> of course, but anyway, this was way before him. But. So, Mark 11, 22 starts off, And Jesus answering saith unto them, 
have faith in God, or have the God kind of faith. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he has said, <clears throat> or he saith, shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Let's go, I'm just pointing out, if our heart's not condemning us so that we have the confidence toward God, we can say whatever we, we want. I know that sometimes kind of is hard on our religion or whatever. <laughs> I guess if we, if we can't grasp it, it's because our heart is condemning us. Because then we think, well, anything? Like, yeah, if our, anything, if it's in line, in line with the word, anything. Hallelujah. Then verse 24 says, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. And it's not for a sweeper. Sweeper is a need, right? <laughs> Let's put that out there. Because it says what you want. Whatsoever you want, when you desire, when you ask, you shall receive them. Hallelujah. So yeah. So what? If I got, hopefully I got that out clear. If our heart's not condemning us, we can have comfort when we ask, believing that it's on the way. Hallelujah. I think that's it. Um, now I want to do. A, I guess y'all could stand up with me, and I'm going to declare. I like this declaration in here. You know what, I'd like to just share something. It's maybe a little premature, but kind of fascinating. Um, there was a job in Montrose I drove by, and I was like, that's my job. I'm going to frame it. Well, a week or so later, I drove by, and somebody else was framing it. <laughs> so, but I went back past there and talked with the guys. He's like, oh, yeah, they got, he gave me the number, the builder they're working for, and they got all kinds of work, so. Maybe sometimes what we speak comes in a different way. I don't know. I'm not sure how to look at it exactly, but so might be anyway something coming up. So thank you, Jesus. So I'm just going to declare over our uh, finances. We decree you begin receiving divine and unexpected financial provision to meet every need. We say that debts and deficits are removed and bills are paid on time every time. <clears throat> We speak that there is financial peace in your life, and what has been lacking begins to be filled and supplied. We declare that increase begins to surround your life long term, and we declare a settling of all financial problems and issues. We say you receive gainful employment and stable income for your work. In Jesus' name, we bind the enemy's power to create excess breakdowns, and repairs causing expenses that rob your resources. We declare financial provision comes now. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. Father, thank you. Thank you for your promises, Father. That when we tithe, you open the windows of heaven. And you rebuke the devourer. We don't have to because you rebuke the devourer. Thank you, Father. Jesus name amen hallelujah hallelujah you know as I was a lot of us our bodies are a little tired tonight some of the things we had going this today um, it's a good opportunity for all of us to tap into sometimes the uh, what we call the anointing um, I, I find that sometimes when my body is really tired uh, I can actually keep uh, that from manifesting itself and rely on him more. So I think it's a, it was a good practice for the worship team. You know, you don't have a whole lot of time. Um, last summer I flew over to Ukraine and, and uh, had 36 hours of travel and walked into the pulpit with two, three hours of sleep and uh, preached Jesus and uh, probably over 50 people came uh, on the altar call. I was just astounded because I didn't feel very annoying. I felt kind of tired and draggy. And, and, but, you know, the Holy Spirit will minister far.
far beyond and supersede what our bodies can do. And, and as I was just standing here worshiping, you know, this is something that the worship team, you know, sometimes you have to work through these things and it's okay, right? And so tonight, if, if you help with, the, with what the youth were doing and you're a little bit tired, tap into that. Don't lean onto yourself, but tap in to what he has and tap into what uh, the anointing has for you because the anointing is what we're after. Without the anointing, we're nothing. I've felt very unanointed at times. I've felt very... Um, uh, I've prayed prayers that didn't, didn't... It felt like a brick hit you in the face. And, and you go away and you're like, huh, what did I do? Like, I sure don't feel anointed. And then God would move so powerfully through that time and you're just like, wow, how did that happen? Because it's not me, it's not what we do and it's not everything we got to get ourselves out of the way that's what we've got to work on and we got to let the anointing operate and uh some a lot of times we we just need to step back and let god do what he wants to do amen so so cool uh i'm just glad god works through imperfect people are you glad god works through imperfect people well he works through you <laughs> Well, the pastor, he has to be perfect, right? Nope, he's not going to be, I'm telling you that right now. And, uh, but I, I, I can still have, uh, we, we work with the light that we have, and with the light that we have and a willing heart, God will use us, right? Working with the light that we have and a willing heart, God will then use us. And uh, we're here, His Word is to be proclaimed. His righteousness is to be proclaimed. Amen. Uh, just a little bit more what Lee was talking about um, on, on uh, mountain moving faith. I just really appreciated what you said, Lee. Um, you bring things to the table that just, that just you know, make you think and, and don't be ashamed of what the gospel is. Preach it strong. And, and uh, mountain-moving faith, that's, that's what we're to have. We're supposed to be different from the world. And our words matter, amen? Our words really, really do matter. Well, last week I uh, spoke on... Uh, uh, before we get into that, uh, I just want to say thank you, thank you again for everybody that helped today uh, and yesterday. It was, it was a stretch for us. We got some men that work some hours making some amazing food and then then we have to then the ladies had to coax it along and keep it you know at optimal temperature so that it would you know be presentable to eat and uh, we're just very thankful for the youth for each one of you that it, you know we I, I watch people work together so awesomely you know the give and the take and the ebb and the flow and having fun but yet some people wouldn't leave their post it was cold, it was snowy, it wasn't the most optimal thing, but you know what? You did your job, you finished it, you completed it, and so well done. Well done. Um, you could have grumped and complained, you didn't. And I, I just heard a lot of uh, encourage, encouragement, and, and um, maybe it wasn't exactly how we thought it would turn out, but you know what? Forget that. We never lose in life. We just get, get some more experience. Amen? We get some more experience. And we did okay. We covered expenses. And uh, we more than co covered expenses. And I am just thankful because each one of these situations uh, causes us to work together because the body needs each other. Amen? The body needs to work together. So I'm just very, very thankful for, for each person and, and all the hard work they put into it. Well, last week we started, um, uh, when I finished up, I was shaking my head because it, this just come out of my spirit that we ha I, I suddenly had enough material to preach like three sermons. And I was like, Lord, what's that all about? And uh, well, this week I was kind of like, Lord, you knew exactly what I needed a whole week ahead of schedule. Um, you know, today I didn't have as much time to prepare, but you know, that's when we lean in on him and we depend on on the anointing. That doesn't mean we don't ever 
prepare things, right, as we get ready, but it, it's, it's still the leaning in on Him, and I'm just like, Lord, you open something up, and I had one uh, testimony from last week where a lady uh, that she had never heard a sermon like, I, that, was, like that was preached last week, and that kind of uh, shocked me because uh, we're talking about um, we started in Proverbs 23, verse 17, that talks about as a man thinketh, so is he, right? As a man thinketh, so is he. So what, what that ends up doing is we end up being the sum total of our thinking. The sum total of our thinking. So it matters what we think. It matters um, how we think. It matters um, what we think about. And, and you know, if you're... If, if, you know, you can go uh, around around the Marigo bush or, or whatever it is that you go around in uh, and uh, uh, Marigo-round maybe, but uh, about whether the cup is half full or half empty. And, and some people accuse me of being an optimist, but I tell you what, I would li- I'd rather fall on the side of optimism than, pe- uh, than, than the other side of, of being pessimistic because there is something about positivity even though the world takes it to a different level and some christians get drug into just positive thinking that's not what i'm talking about Uh, i'm not just talking about being uh, positive thinking but it does affect the way uh, how we think and if i'm positive about something it helps me see a, a higher level and a bigger vision if i'm negative about it uh, and I was just blessed by your story, Lee, because uh, so, you, so you spoke to a job site. And, and, and it was little, reminded me when Lee told me the story, I just started laughing because the very first thing I prayed for was a duck. I laid hands on the duck, and I was convinced God was going to heal it. I had read in my Bible that lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, and this duck wasn't doing very well. So I grabbed that duck, and I, in the name of Jesus, I commanded healing. And uh, I was convinced that duck would, was, gonna, was healed. The next day I showed up, and it was dead. And immediately the bombardment, bombardment of thinking that came on me that, oh, uh, see, didn't work, see, the words uh, not accurate, the words not true, and it was just an attack of the enemy. Uh, I mean, Satan went around, he made sure that duck died. Because he wanted to rob the seed that was beginning to grow in my heart. And so uh, Lee, you know, when he seen that other builder building on on that foundation that he had said is is his in Jesus' name, the temptation is, see, it doesn't work, see, this stuff doesn't work. And he would have left Montrose and never looked back. But you know, sometimes we got to dig a little deeper. We got to go a little further. We got to say, you know what, the word does work. And I don't always know the reasons why it didn't work out exactly the way I wanted it to work in a certain situation. And the reason it doesn't always work out the way exactly the way I want it to work in certain situations uh, is because we don't know all things like God does. Right? And so to press in and even to say, you know what, I don't know what the deal was. There's somebody else building on my foundation. I'm going to go talk to him. <laughs> but see, a lot of people wouldn't have done that. They didn't just tuck tail and ran. And, and said, well, you know what, I don't know, maybe the word doesn't work. Maybe God isn't true. Maybe, maybe what he says, maybe we can't ask for everything. Maybe I can't command things and, uh, and, and have it happen in, in, in life. And, and I don't know about this. And, and all these th- thoughts of doubt come flooding into our, the, your brain, and you just think doubt. But you to, to stop that cycle of doubt and say, you know what, I don't know all things. Lord, what do you have for me here? What's going on? you know what, I, I'm going to at least stop and talk to the guy. Right? That, that takes some spiritual fortitude uh, of to step back and say, well, you know what, didn't happen exactly. We all have stories that didn't happen exactly the way we thought it was going to happen. And sometimes it's good to step back and say, okay, Lord, what do you have? What's going on here? And still press in and still believe God is good. Still believe what He said in His Word is the truth. Okay, see, see, a lot of times as as human beings, as as good Christians, as people that have learned to know Jesus, a lot of times 
um, we will internalize these things and rob ourselves uh, from pressing in deeper because we then convince ourselves that somehow God messed it up. And I'm here to tell you, I'm going to say this till I'm blue in the face, God is not in the messing up business. And it has never been His fault. Never. Yet people are angry at God, shake their fists at God, tell Him all kinds of stuff about how it's His fault and He hasn't come through and He didn't do His job and He didn't do what He promised. It has never been His fault. It has never been His fault. Only goodness can come from Him. You know, I picked up a book uh, this last week and started reading it and just started laughing. And uh, I think, uh, I'm still praying about it, but I do kind of felt a tug in my heart that we may go through it uh, as a church. And, and, and the title of the book is In Search of Timothy. And the very first chapter, I think Kim even talked about this a little bit at one point, maybe it was Tuesday night, but the very first chapter, it talked about a, it, and, and he kind of veiled the first chapter uh, a little bit, but he, he was talking about um, a, a man that uh, lost 30% of his congregation. He's, he, he built up, a, um, um, uh, had, a, had a church, and, and it, was, it was a good church, but 30% of the congregation decided to leave. And, and then he started over with, uh, um, at, at some point in, in his life, he started over with just a couple, and then that all went to nothing. And, and it took him years to build back up and, and actually have something presentable. And at the end of the chapter, he says, I'm talking about God the Father and Jesus. You know, God the Father, what did God do that he lost 30% of the angels? You think God did something wrong that 30% of the angels said, you know what, adios, we're out of here. You know what, God the Father... You're not doing a good enough job. We're leaving you. And so, the, so the, the book says sometimes it's not a leadership problem, sometimes it's a followership, followership problem. You know, in, in that 30% that left God, the followers, the followers had a problem, didn't they? There was pride that, that was uh, found in one of them, right? And he wanted to be like the Most High. And he ended up coming against the Father and getting kicked out of heaven. Right? But it wasn't anything God did. What did God do that Adam and Eve left him? See, sometimes we have these, you know, we look at a leader and we see people leave a leader and we go and we immediately peg and say, man, that guy's got issues. He lost half his congregation. What if it wasn't anything he did? What if he was just following God? And I'm not here trying to say that just to make pastors look good. I'm just simply saying sometimes we've got to look at this some more. right? It's not always a leadership. It's not always a leadership problem. And one of the things that I find out in Christians and I see in Christians is they're very willing to blame God. They're very willing to say it's His fault. Well, this comes from faulty thinking. Right? This comes from faulty thinking. In other words, when you see that happening and people are beginning to blame God, we got to look and we got to analyze, well, what are they thinking about? Well, they've believed the lie that they were told. Right? And they accepted it as truth. So thinking is very crucial to us. That's, that's where we, need, we, we process things. God has given you a brain, but then Proverbs tell us don't lean to your own understanding. See, trust in Him and lean not to your understanding. So thinking is your understanding. Thinking is a vital part of what you do, but you don't lean on it. You know, just, you know, just recently we had an opportunity where, where Kim and I were discussing some things and, and, and you know, a person was just kind of acting strange. And, and the temptation is, well, why are they acting like that? And you go, no, 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 not even going to go down that road. I don't know. You know what? They might have things going on in their life we know nothing about. And they might be just caught up in some things going on in their life. And they might have acted really strange to us. But you know what? Who cares? 
Does it, who cares how they treated me? But see, a lot of times when we're offended by how somebody's tre- treated, treating me is because we're walking around going, you know, I'm really something. And you ought to treat me a little better than that, Lee. <laughs> and don't you dare give me the cold shoulder because I'm something over here. Right? And Lee gives me the cold shoulder. And what's Lee's problem? And then, you know, instead of going to Lee and say, hey, what's your problem? Half the church goes, Connor, what's Lee's problem? I don't understand why Lee's acting like that. I mean, isn't he kind of ridiculous? Did you see how he acted? He acted, do you see how he acted to me? I mean, isn't that ridiculous? And Connor goes, yeah, yeah, that's ridiculous. And and then we got to go tell John. You know, Lee's been acting really strange. And I never had the guts to just say, hey, Lee, you know, I just noticed something was off. You okay? Everything okay, Lee? And Lee goes, you know, I've really been dealing with some... Some dude on the job site has nothing to do with me. That's the, and, and then the, we have an open door to the enemy to get into our thinking and just run havoc. Run havoc. And we lay in bed till midnight wondering how, what a person was doing or thinking about us. Come to find out they never were thinking about us. And you stayed up half the night wondering. <laughs> you never even were that important. <laughs> you never even made it in their top ten of the day. You didn't get to t- top ten. Maybe you didn't even make their top fifty. <laughs> You're really not that important in their life. These are things that we got to understand because the enemy will prey on our thinking. And when we run our thinking and it's in a runaway train, we need to bring it to a screeching halt. And sometimes we got to be like, you know what? You know, I don't know what Vern has going on, but I'm going to believe the best. I'm going to believe the best in a person. I don't know what they have going on, but I'm going to believe that there's something uh, that the, the best for them. And I'm going to bl- believe that. You know, that there's just, I am not going to allow my brain to spin out of control. And we got to take authority over that. And we got to say, and sometimes you got to take yourself by the ear. I've had to do this, and I didn't understand. I, I'm surprised that I had, uh, at the time, had the, had the understanding, but somewhere along the line, I had learned it. And there was times I grabbed myself by the ear. You know how some parents will grab their kids by the ear and drag them off in another room? You ever do that to yourself? You ever? You should try it sometimes. It's kind of funny. You just take that right hand and you just reach up there and you just grab yourself right here and you say, Jay, we're going to have a conversation. And you just take yourself and you take yourself into another room and you get before God and you say, you know what, Lord? I don't know what's going on, but, but, but I need some things changed in my life. I can't keep thinking this way. I can't keep thinking thoughts of depression. I can't keep thinking thoughts of failure. I can't keep thinking thoughts of I can't do it. I can't keep thinking these thoughts because in, what it'll do, it'll become a reality. What your thoughts do is begin to paint a picture on the inside of you and that picture of the inside of you says you can't. Right? Says that you can't. And because of you thinking you can't, the man that thinks he can't and the man that thinks he can are both right. Right? The man that thinks he can't and the man that thinks he can are both right. So we were talking here, Proverbs 23, we went to Romans 12. Let's just go to Romans 12. Let's uh, still kind of reviewing, but I think uh, we need to get this deep into us. Romans chapter 12. Now let's, like I said last week, let's don't say this uh, in a sing-song voice. Can we get that verse up on the screen? It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren... In the mercies of God, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, 
And I'd memorize this in the King James. Sometimes it's easy to just skim over it. And I want you guys to understand that Paul, uh, picture Paul, uh, this beseech you. He's on his one knee saying, look, guys, I beg you. I'm begging you guys by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. How many know that your body, like tonight, my body didn't feel like preaching? If I'd have just let my body go, y'all would have been on your own. <laughs> but you've got to have control over your body, right? Well, well, I did some things and made some choices that got me to this place, right? I mean, I was cold. I mean, you know what would have been the best place to go tonight? Straight to your way to the hot springs. And I'm sure you would have been. And we'd enjoyed tonight, and we'd have said they can just have church by themselves. Right? But that's not what God told us to do. Sometimes your body is a living sacrifice. Sometimes you got to go, you know what? I don't care what my body feels like. I'm going to step into the anointing, and I'm going to believe God that He's anointed me. Right? right? And, and it's good, to, and, and I've, I, you kind of learn how to do this. Now, sometimes um, in life... Um, there's, you know, you don't always step into the pulpit per se, but there is something God has asked you to do, and because He's asked you to do, He's anointed you to do it, and you're going to have to sacrifice your body to get into that. I don't care who you are. So He's saying, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, also holy. So here goes this easy, greasy grace that you. I'm just covered by God's grace and I can do anything I want. Well, right here it says be holy. Acceptable to God. Yeah, God's grace covers you, but you're to put off the old man. We have scripture that says put off the old man, right? Well, what is put off the old man? What do you do when you put off your coat? How, how do you put off your coat? You take it off. So he's, you know, we have scripture that says. This holiness, there's something about it. You don't just run around, do whatever you want, just say, oh, well, you know, I'm covered. I'm covered by grace. No. You, there, there is. He wouldn't say the first part if it wouldn't be an issue. There wouldn't, because, because if you're just covered with everything that you do and, and there's nothing on your part, then there'd never be a living sacrifice. There'd never be a time you feel like wiggling off the altar. There'd never be a time where it kind of feels hard and you've got to push through and tap into His anointing. There'd never be a time because it'd just be automatic. But no, and that's not what He's saying. He's saying you're presenting your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is just your reasonable service. And the reason it's your reasonable service is because what you did, what He did, I mean, is what He did. I mean, He hung on the cross for you. You don't think you can do just hang in there just another five minutes, Lee? And whatever He's asked you to do? You know, He put nails in His hands. You don't think you got another ten minutes you can last in doing what God's asked you to do? Right? So sometimes this, this happens. Let's go to verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed to the world. How does the world conform you? How does the world, how do you, how are you conformed to the world? How are you conformed to the world? Well, it tells you in the next phrase. Uh, he goes, uh, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So apparently, not being transformed by the renewing of your mind is being conformed to the world. So being conformed to the world isn't about your dress or how you look. It's about how you think. It's about how you think. See, the world uh, just lets their brain spin out of control. The world lets their, their brain uh, you know, run through its gymnastic courses of, of, of being depressed. The world does those things. And, and we as Christians need to be transformed like a butterfly. You know how a butterfly is metamorphosed, right? It crawls into a cocoon, 
and it comes out later completely different than when it crawled in. That's this word transformed. But be transformed. How do you become transformed? By the renewing of your mind. By reshaping how you think. So when, when the Scripture says that you're more than conquerors, but you face defeat ten times in things you did. The last ten things you face, you face defeat. But Scripture says you're more than a conqueror. Scripture says you're more than a conqueror. Scripture says you're more than a conqueror. Not just a conqueror. You're more than a conqueror. Scripture says to speak to your mountain, and it shall be removed. Right? Scripture says these, all these different things, nothing's going to separate you from the love of God, Lee. Nothing. I don't care what you go through. Nothing's going to separate you from the love of God, but you feel alone. You feel that God doesn't love you. You're pretty sure it's His fault. You're pretty sure it's His problem. Right? But Scripture says nothing's going to separate you from the love of God. See, you've got, you got to get that down on the inside of you, and you've got to paint a new picture in your mind of your transformation why? That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That you may prove. See, when you renew your mind, and it says, my God shall supply all my needs according to His riches and glory. You start meditating on that. You're renewing your mind that all your needs are met. Right? All your needs are met. All your needs are met by His riches and glory. Not yours. Not your riches. Not your glory. But His riches and His glory. You get that on the inside of you, it'll change you because you'll come up against the need and all you got is say, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. Jesus, you got some mail. You ever get some mail that you wish you wouldn't have gotten? I mean, it's kind of like a prayer request when those bills come. And you just grab them and you look at them and say, Jesus, I don't have the money to pay that, but you promise that all my needs are met. So, Lord, you have mail. Because see, He's in you. He's promised it. You get, you get um, your need then becomes His. And He'll meet it according to His riches and glory. Amen? And last time I checked, he's pretty rich. I mean, I don't know, when was the last time you brought your sapphire stone for your footstool? When was the last time you did that? I mean, he's used to walking on streets of gold. I don't know what his throne's made of, but it sparkles and glistens. And we have people that talk about how amazing the throne looks that God sits on. Some of you may have seen some of glimpses of it. And that, but we're still like Paul, that we still see through a glass dimly. Right? We might have just got some glimpses of how amazing it is. Right? And we're still seeing it kind of foggy. But there will be coming a day where you'll see what He actually has. And His riches are amazing. Are amazing. See, we've got to get our mind to stop being conformed to this world. See, the fear-mongering that's happening in this world right now is a strategy of the enemy to bring us down. I mean, you can't read a headline without it being fear-mongering. You know, probably seen it here just this last week. They, uh, uh, Project Veritas interviewed uh, this, this scientist and and the scientist is admitting that, oh, well, man, they got more COVID viruses. I mean, they're just playing around in the lab making this stuff. And you can say, oh, that's not true. Or you can say, oh, it is true. You know what? I'm not there. I don't 100% know. But I know one thing. They use COVID to fear monger. And they got the whole world in fear of what it's going to do. It's going to kill everybody. And it's going to do this. And it's going to do that. And all this stuff. And when something becomes that kind of fear-mongering, you need to be aware and renew your mind. What is God saying? I am not going to get into this fear-mongering business. Because with fear-mongering, people will do anything to get out of the fear in the natural. And all they will do is control you more. It's all they're going to do because that's what they're after. Man is always after control. 
And so if they can get you to fear, well, if you fear, you'll do anything. I mean, I, I, it took me a long time to understand this um, till a couple years ago, but how did the Jews willingly walk in to the gas chambers and get gassed? You ever think about that? How did that happen? I mean, wouldn't you just kind of raise up a fit outside the gas chambers? Wouldn't you say, you know what, it's enough, it's enough. I'm, I'm not going in there to die. I know exactly what you guys are doing. You're putting, our, putting us in there, and, and you're slaughtering us. So if I'm going to die anyway, wouldn't you rather be outside and, and raise a stink than go into, into a gas chamber and just fall over dead? What kept them from doing something outside? Fear. I'm not saying they would have lived. I'm just saying, you know what? I'm, not, I'm going down without a puff of smoke in my face. I'm going to go down. At least I can look at myself in the mirror and say, you know, if I'm going to go down, let's at least put up a fight. Oh, you're going to lose anyway. So what? <laughs> I mean, I don't know about you, but you like to fight. I mean, maybe you don't like to fight, but I'd rather have that than nothing. But yet they led these people in by the hundreds and the thousands. Why? Because of fear. Why didn't people do anything about it? Why didn't people do anything about it? You know, when the train went by the railroad track, on the railroad track, I guess that's the only thing it would go by on, uh, but it, it, if it's going down the railroad track with carloads of people in it and the church sings their hymns just a little louder so they can't hear the screams of the people, we got a problem. What got the church to that point? Well, it got to that point because of fear. Well, you know what? If you guys make a fuss, you're all dying. Right? And at some point, somebody's got to stand up and say, you know what? Stop this fear-mongering. And every headline, like I can't get over it here in, in the last uh, year, and I understand things take a long time to see results, and, and, and science has its slow wheel of turn and, and, and all this stuff, but I, I just can't help but notice the narrative of the drought in the West being on plastered on every single headline there is. It'll talk about... Uh, more snow than normal, uh, but they'll make sure they tell you, uh, but the drought is not over. <laughs> you know, we're at 300% snowpack in, in California, but, but it's still under severe drought. And, and we know in the last year, we have had a huge change, and we've had more rain last summer than, than we had, and, and they stopped saying, even talking about drought or, 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 or uh, flooding, uh, it's now climate change. See, they had to change what they're saying because the drought narrative was no longer working because it's now raining. There's actually moisture falling from the sky. Now, that doesn't mean everything's taken care of. I get it, I get it, I understand that. But they have to change the narrative because now they can blame drought and flooding on climate change. So you can't win. California now has floods, but it's climate change. And you wonder why I distrust science. I just read another headline this week, last week. They're trying to blame eggs on something again. And I'm just like, in my lifetime, how many times have eggs been good for you and terrible for you in a matter of three or four years? And now they're back to eggs not being it. Oh, eggs this, eggs that. And I'm just a bunch of fear mongering. See, we've got to renew our minds to what God's telling us. You, we cannot focus on that. It'll drive us insane. And we've got to get back to being transformed. How am I transformed? How am I, how am I different from the world? By the way I think. That's how I'm different. I am different by the way I think. Now, we also went to, um, let's go over to 2 Corinthians 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians 10, uh, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, 
but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. See, when we have, when, when, when your brain goes out of control in a certain vein, a stronghold becomes built. And this is what it takes to break these strongholds. Now, sometimes you don't even know, a lot of times you don't even realize you have a stronghold. I mean, it's, it's kind of common sense, but not too many people are running around going, you know, I've got a stronghold and I know about it and I don't care. <laughs> now, there might be a few that do, but most of the time strongholds are kind of blind to the person that has them and it actually takes somebody else, uh, sometimes it's your wife, sometimes it's your husband, and uh, to point out the stronghold and about the time you don't really want to take it off somebody that there's a stronghold, that's probably where the stronghold is. Say, oh man, oh, oh me. <laughs> One of the two, right? And, and sometimes, as, as uh, being married, sometimes we're not always the person that are to point it out in our spouse. And we've got to be led in this. And, and as Kim sometimes says, she's like, man, I've been telling you that for three months. And then, you know, some preacher will show up and I'll go home and say, you know what? I've got to take care of this issue in my life. And she's like, I've been telling you that for three or six months. And you haven't listened, and a lot of times like, yeah, hmm, yeah. Well, honey, you've planted the seed. <laughs> you planted the seed, and today is now bringing forth some fruit. <laughs> for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Where are the strongholds? They're in your mind. Why do you do what you do every time? Why do you react the way you react every time? What is that? It's the pulling, it's the stronghold that needs to be pulled down because of, of you know, sin, carnality, wrong thinking. You might have been taught something all your life by the time since you were two three years old i mean it could go back to you know i had an epiphany after i got married but i grew up and you know uh we very rarely had really good snacks at the house and so growing up and if we did have a really good snack uh, there was a limited supply and see uh, that whole theory about limited resources i firmly understood there was limited resources in my household that I grew up in. And now I happen to be the oldest and the biggest, so I would try to, uh, I could help my limited resources to a certain extent just because I was the biggest. But I remember getting married, Kim goes grocery shopping, and she comes home with an entire box of chicken and the biscuit crackers. And I remember looking at that box going, I can have an entire box all to myself. I don't have to share other than Kim because she's only going to eat. Well, you didn't, I don't even know that you really liked them. But I knew I loved them, and we never had them. And I had to share with all my siblings growing up. And thank God, finally, there was a day I didn't have to share. <laughs> I mean, you could just see the carnality. Now I don't even like the crackers that much. <laughs> An overabundance. But at the time, there, you know, my, my thinking, there was a stronghold going on in my scarcity thinking, I mean, there was only so many chicken and the biscuits made in the world. And we had a mighty big family. And so I knew that there was limited resources for me. Come to find out, I serve an abundant God. And I've come to find out that we could go to the store and get all the chicken and the biscuit. You know, the shells were always there. They were full of chicken and the biscuit crackers all that time. I just didn't know it. Now my mom, she was trying to make sure that we got at healthy food, I'm sure, and we wouldn't gorge ourselves on chicken and the biscuit crackers growing up. And it was probably some, some parts of that being smart because I wouldn't have been able, I would have indulged, right? I would have just, thank you, Lord, for all your goodness. And I wouldn't even known it was Him. I would have just ate because I wanted to, <laughs> right? So we have strongholds in our life, but you know that simple thing about the chicken and the biscuit, that chicken and the biscuit is scarce and there's not more made, I will then carry that thought process into every other area of my life. 
And it wasn't until we were married about four years that I began to understand. In fact, it was so much embedded in my life that I thought that for us to survive, I, for me to win in life, for Jay to win, somebody must lose. Because there's only so much. I mean, and, and I remember I go to school and parents said it and school teachers said it and everybody said there's limited resources. I mean, back in the 90s, how many heard stories? We're running out of oil. Do you know that that come back from the 1800s? The 1800s, the sailors would come back to, to um, England and they're like, you know, we're running out of whale blubber. There's just so many whales on the earth. And, uh, you know, we're lighting the streets of London with whale blubber oil and uh, we got to go further to kill whales than we ever did before. Uh, it's limited. We're all going to die. Or at least not have light. <laughs> right? And then uh, something peculiar happened in uh, 18, I want to say 1890s. Uh, there was this man named Francis Drake in Titusville, Pennsylvania that happened to hit something called oil that put the whalers smack out of business. <laughs> I didn't see that coming. And you could take a gallon of this stuff and refine it and run for days. And what lit a lamp for overnight, you could now put this amazing gas to it and it could run and run and run and oh by the way this stuff just kind of bubbled out of the ground well it didn't take long for man to think the man's ways and well pff, there's just not much oil on the earth is there i now hear people talk about that the united states has more oil than it ever had before where's this stuff coming from and we keep inventing things to find this stuff. And, and, and there's uh, great pools of oil that we're coming across. And now there's tar sands we can make oil out of. There is plenty of oil on this earth. And then just the other month, somebody figured out something else called fusion. Anybody hear about that? What if we perfect fusion in the next years? And also, we don't even need oil. And so all the fear-mongering that we're running out of oil, there's not enough oil for you, and there's not enough oil for me, and there's wars that have been fought over limited supply of oil, and now we have unlimited energy in what you call fusion. It was all there the whole time. It was all available the whole time. Man is just catching up to what God had. Man's just catching up to figuring out what God already has planned. And forget oil. We don't even need oil. I mean, they burn that uh, gas, uh, the methane gas up on, in North Dakota, whatever gases they were burning, burning off. Uh, we don't even need an, an oil well anymore. Now, that's a little premature. We've got some developing to do. I'm just saying that that possibly can happen, Right? Why? Because we've had strongholds in our thinking. We have strongholds in believing there's not enough. And I know it's funny when you think about me glorying in a box of chicken and the biscuits. But what affected my thinking is what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. We constantly come across with, uh, things in our day that... We don't have enough. They're short, and so I've got to protect myself. See, part of people not getting along is because there's not enough. And so I can't get along with Lee because there's not enough in this world. And then you can get into uh, competing anointings. Now, a lot of people don't want to talk about this, but it's the truth. And the Lord had to show me some things. You know, if you understand your gift and callings in the Lord, there's no competition for what you have. There's no competition. 
because you know what the Lord has called you to be. And I remember standing outside my bedroom and I was dealing with it. I was, as a pastor, I'm dealing with uh, somebody we loved and knew and, and um, there was competition. If, if you could just tell right away as soon as you're around them that there's some competition. Like, you know, we can't flow together on this. If somebody's got to come out on top, uh, in, in, in what we're doing for Jesus. How many know that's straight from the pit of hell? Straight from the pit of hell. And I remember um, uh, st- uh, standing there in front of my bedroom door, and I'm crying out to the Lord saying, why? What, what's going on here? Why is this happening? And, and the Lord just started ministering to me, say, and, because here, here's why it felt unjust to me. Because they would bebop around and run out of anointing. <laughs> And then they'd show up to church to get recharged and refilled. And then they'd go be bopping all around doing their thing and run out. And, and then they'd come to church and, and get filled and filled with the Holy Ghost and with power. And then they'd run off and then they'd come back. You kind of feel used after a while. And I'm, I'm, I'm telling the Lord, you know, I kind of feel used here. They just show up. You know, they don't want to be in the, in, in the mundane things of the church they just want to show up on the exciting times they just want to show when things are popping things are happening they just want to show up for those special occasions oh dear lord they don't want to be with us when things are a little tough oh no we're out of here right they just want to be here when it's cool to have church i'm having a problem and i'm going lord deal with these people How many know when you make that prayer, you can just automatically know there's something in my life that needs to be dealt with? I'm like, Lord, they got problems, they got issues, and you need to deal with them. And the Lord started speaking to me, and He goes, You know what? He goes, My anointing is unlimited. My anointing is unlimited. So what if they show up and take some of the, suck up the anointing? Well, and there is truth to this where sometimes people you get around, they'll suck you dry. Right? They'll suck everything out of you. And, and, and it doesn't always feel the best. But you know what? The Lord started ministering to me saying the anointing is unlimited. And if my anointing is unlimited, it's unlimited for you, son, is what He was telling me. And so I can tap into an unlimited anointing. And guess what? I probably have treated God the same way these people were treating me. Boom. Problem fixed. Stronghold pulled down. (laughs) Right? Stronghold pulled down. Changed my thinking. God has unlimited anointing. It's a matter of us tapping in to receive it and if i'm dry it's because i haven't tapped in and received it i haven't changed my thinking see i'm still thinking god's like chicken in the biscuits and there's only so many chicken in the biscuits and they sucked me dry of all the chicken in the biscuits i mean the stores store shelf was empty and you know they'll make more and so I don't really like them anymore because they just show up and take all, uh, take all the chicken and the biscuits off the shelf. And, and so now I've got a problem with them because I don't ever have chicken in the biscuits when they're around because they take it all. Come to find out there's factories that make this every day. And oh, by the way, there's more stores. And I've got to stop thinking that there's only so much because there is so much more he makes my cup overflow do you think god doesn't know when your cup is fully i mean god knows how many hair you have on the head but he just probably doesn't know when your cup's full does he because he keeps on pouring and you're like whoa lord uh you're getting close to the brim and i can just see god chuckling going (laughs) yeah one more yeah, but it's going to make a mess, God. That's why I'm giving you some more. Yeah, but my saucer is now full. Yeah, I'm going to make it run on the table. I'm going to make it run off the table. I'm going to make it run out the door just for you. Because there's plenty 
where this comes from. God is not running out. What's running out is my thinking because i got a stronghold bringing the world's thinking into my relationship with God. See, the world says there's not enough. The world says that there's a limited supply. That's what the world says. The world says, we're going to run out. The world says, we don't have enough. The world says, there's only so much to go around. The world says, you know, in 30 years, you're going to have like a 3x3 three three area land to stand on. How many heard that in school? What school did you guys go to? <laughs> I remember going to school, science class, yep, in 30 to 40 years, they estimate nine square meters or nine, I don't know what it was anymore, but limited amount of land because we're going to have such a population boom that we're going to have a limited amount of land and at some point in life, we're just going to have enough to stand on. And we still got the Amazon that hasn't even been explored. In fact, there's people down there that say there's animals we don't even know about running around in the Amazon right now. We've never, that never seen, that, that men haven't documented yet that, that would want to document it. I just talked to a friend of mine, he went over to India here this last year, and he said that they got into villages that had never seen a white person. Never. I mean, they're looking at him, gawking at him like, dude, <laughs> white person. They had never seen a white person. We kind of think that uh, white people have been everywhere. Nope. Nope. Still more to explore on this earth. Still more places to see. Still more places to go. Still more places to preach the gospel. We haven't been everywhere. God is an unlimited God. The only thing that limits God... What, what, what do you think is what limits God? Our thinking. My thinking, my thinking, thinking is what limits him. Because my thinking keeps these strongholds in place. And then when these strongholds are in place, God can't do what he wants to do in my life. That's why, go to verse 5, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to what? To the obedience of Christ. How do you bring, how do you break a stronghold? How do you break a stronghold in your life? How do you cast down arguments? How do you come against every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. See, running out of oil exalts itself against the very thing God did on this earth. He put all the stuff in this earth for man. And do you actually think man could be big enough to actually come against and, and run out? I mean, let's just think about that. God knew before the foundations of the earth exactly how much oil is needed on this earth. He knew exactly when we're going to invent certain things that we won't even need oil. He knew exactly what inventions man are, is going to have in just the, in the right time. And sometimes when, when there's pressure, man will begin to, to think outside the box because they're pressured to think outside the box. And they'll come up with some radical stuff. Right? But God knew it the whole time. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. It doesn't matter if, uh, uh, if you're coming against a person. It doesn't matter if you're coming uh, against uh, things that you're thinking. Every thought that you can bring your thoughts into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ. And I, I've found this in my life. When I get to a place 
of I'm looking at something and it's either or. Either or. Either or. Either or is always something the enemy uses. Either or. Like, well, either you can do this or you could do that, right? Either or. Well, you, you, you have choices, but most of the time, either or is connected to scarcity. Either or. Well, you know, we only got so much money, so you could have either the uh, granola or the Cheerios. One of the two. You can't, you can't, you know, it's just one or the other, right? Scarcity. What about both and? And I try to ask myself, every, every time I come, come up against an either or, God is a both and God. God is a both and. See, He pours till the cup runs over. The cup and the saucer. He, he's, he's put rivers of, of living water in you that are going to flow out of you. It wasn't a drop. He could have made it a drop, but He didn't make it a drop. No, He says it's going to be rivers. Rivers of living water. Not dead water, but living water. It's going to pour out of you. Why is it pouring out of you? It's pouring out of you so that you can touch the nations. It's pouring out of you so you can touch the world. It's pouring out of you so that you can think different. It's pouring out of you so that you can renew your mind and not be conformed to the world in the way they think, but you can renew your mind and begin to think the way God thinks. And you can cast down arguments and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Because that's really what it does. When you say God is not enough, you're actually bringing something up and saying it's greater than God. See, when, when you say, well, God wasn't enough here for me, what you just did is you exalted something higher than what God is. And you're saying, that's greater than my supply. Right? And it exalts itself against the knowledge of God. See, that's what had happened in the Garden of Eden. Nothing's changed to this day. Uh, the, the enemy comes, he tempts Eve. She, uh, in, in turn, uh, uh, tempts Adam. Adam seen what was happening, but he continued to go with it. And basically, the, the root of the temptation was, is, I mean, there, there's, there's all this in the garden that you're enjoying, right? There's all this in the garden that you have, but God's actually holding out on you. God's actually holding out and withholding His best. God's withholding His best from you because, see, you can't have this here in the middle of the garden. And because you can't have that, you, you actually, I mean, you could be like God's. If you would take this and eat it, you could be like the gods and know good and evil. See, how many know that you didn't even know, have to know evil? Everything was good. That's all you needed to know. You didn't have to know evil. You didn't have to know evil. But the enemy begins, that's his underlying uh, thought process still today that God's holding out. That's where scarcity comes from. It's coming from because God is withholding His best and He's holding back and He doesn't really love you. And He's withholding that from you. And when He convinces you of that, now you don't believe there's enough. And now that, and, and, and countries have gone to war because they haven't believed there was enough. Much less Households, much less church splits, much less all these other th ever hear of the Hatfields and the McCoys? How many years did they kill each other? Because they didn't think there was enough of something. I think it started with a pig. And one guy, I, I think that's how that argument started. So back in the day, they used to notch pig ears, and it would tell, they'd let them run, and they'd notch the pig ears, and they'd know who owned it. And one of them, Shot the pig and ate it or something. And the other one w and, and the other side was ticked. I don't remember if it was a Hatfield or a McCoy, but the other side was mad because the other side ate his pig, his hog. And see, there's not enough hogs in the world, dear Lord. I mean, hogs multiply like rats. But, but, but there's not enough. And so then they shoot a guy because he ate the hog. Well, now, one side got shot 
So they're out for blood. So they go over there and they shoot it the other side because hey, he shot, you know, it's just we gotta take him out. You know what? It went on for what? 60, 70, 80 years? Because of a pig? Because somebody didn't think there was enough pigs. And one was robbed. See, anytime you come against that kind of thinking, it's not God. And it's exalted itself against the knowledge of God. And we need to bring those thoughts into captivity. What if that Hatfield, let's say it was the Hatfield, because I don't remember which side. But that, so, that, so the McCoy took the pig, and the Hatfield goes, great! You know, I just had a litter of eight. It's no big deal. I'm just going to donate that pig. I didn't really, wasn't thinking of donating it till now, but now I'm going to donate it. And we would have avoided, lives would have been saved. We would have avoided all kinds of atrocities for the next 80 years because somebody decided they're going to donate a pig. It's thinking. Let's go back and finish up in Romans 12. This is why Paul is saying what he's saying in Romans 12. He's begging you to transform yourself. This is how you get transformed by thinking different. Because when you think different, you speak different. You're going to sound different. A transformed person is going to speak faith. A transformed person, you're, you're going to know it when you're with them. You're going to be around Lee, and, and that's why I love hanging out with Lee, and you leave his house or leave his presence, and you're like, man, I'm going to believe more, right? But you can hang out with some people, and you go, oh, man, that was depressing. I mean, they were depressed, now I am depressed. Right? And now you've got to get yourself out of that thinking or you'll be depressed. It'll get over on you. And you know it. And you, know, you, can, you can get around and gossip about people all night long and you walk away with an icky feeling. Or you can get, get around some people. I've got some friends. Get around them and you're talking about changing countries. I want to talk about changing countries. I want to talk about taking the gospel into Jordan, Egypt, Turkey, Iraq, Iran, strategizing. How are we going to do this? How are we going to change a country for Jesus? I don't have time to pick apart and, 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 and try to figure out what a person was thinking uh, about me or if they did or, or why they acted nasty towards me. Don't know. Maybe, maybe the dog bit him five minutes ago. I don't know. Right? I don't have time. We don't have time to figure all those things out. We just simply move right along and tear down those strongholds, tear that uh, ugly thinking. Do we have Romans 12? 1 and 2? I don't see it. There we go. Let's go to verse 2. Do not be conformed to the world, because that's what the world does, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the, the good, that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Your transformation is going to prove the goodness of God. Your transformation is going to prove that God wants to do good in your life. He wants to do good in your life. Let's stand to our feet. Hallelujah. The anointing is free. <laughs> it's not limit, limited. You know, if somebody comes and sucks all the anointing out of you, you say, thank you, Jesus, fill me back up again. Right? It's just that easy. It's, 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 it's all there. God didn't run out. Heaven didn't dim. The lights didn't just like, you know. There's not a power supply shortage in heaven. God's got it all. And it's up to us to continue to receive it. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Father, for each person here tonight that they can learn to tear down strongholds in their life. Tear them down. And Father, and be transformed by the renewing of their mind. That they can read the Word and believe that they're more than conquerors. They can believe the Word that, in, that they can be victorious in all things. And whatever life throws against them, or challenges them. You have given us the tools to win. To win in everything. To win 
in everything. And Father, when it looks like we're losing or in, 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 in the natural, it looks like we're not winning, that, you can, that you're right there helping us, guiding us, transforming our thinking because there's still some things that we're not thinking correctly. But Father, that we continue to think you are a good God. And our cup overflows with your anointing and becomes a river out of us, touching everybody we come uh, into contact with. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Be filled in Jesus' name. Be filled. These earthly bodies sometimes just need a challenge. And sometimes we just need to go, you know what, I'm going to just be filled. I don't feel filled, but I'm going to be filled. Because the Word says, be, be filled. Be being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what the Word says. So I'm going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Well, we'll see you Tuesday night, Monday at noon, Tuesday night Bible study. And yes, Wednesday, Friday morning, 6 to 7 prayer. Hallelujah. See you there.